Hello, viewers and learners of NIUS. I, Piyush Prashad, Academic Officer, NIUS. Together with me, today we are having Mrs. Uma Sanjay Singh, who is an Associate Professor in Delhi University, are going to discuss on the topic Ratio Analysis. Learners, as you know that in our previous module, in our previous program, we have already told you about the liquidity ratio as well as the activity ratio and the types of ratio that are going to be covered under them. Today, in this program, basically we are going to discuss on the topic of solvency ratio and the leverage ratio. Learners, you know ki ratio is going to basically express a relationship between one financial figure in comparison to the another financial figure so that we can be able in a position to draw some conclusions that is a meaningful conclusion and can act upon it. Learners, you know solvency ratio is one of the ratio which is basically calculated to know whether the ability of the firm to make its payments in long term time. That is whether the firm will be in a position to make the payment of its debts together with the interest well in time or not. Now, this ratio is going to cover two type of things. One is known as a debt equity ratio and the other is known as a proprietary ratio. Learners, debt equity ratio is a ratio which establishes the relationship of the outsiders funds with the shareholders funds. That means, outsiders funds include all those type of things which are taken by the business from outside the business that may be in form of the debts, in form of debentures, in form of loans taken from the banks and financial institutions. And we, when we talk of equity, it means the amount of the capital that has been invested by the owner in a business. It includes his capital, his profits, his reserves and so on. So, normally debt equity ratio establishes the relationship between the debts and the owner's funds. Now, when we talk about its formula, it basically debts upon equity, means the total debts that is an outsider's liability is taken in the numerator and the value of the equity is going to be taken in the denominator. Normally, the standard ratio is considered as 2 is to 1. That means that if even if the debts are going to be double the value of the equities, it is considered that business will be able to make the payment of its liabilities well in time and there won't be any problem in that but in case if the equities are less then it is considered as a red signal for a business ki there is some doubt there may be some problems in making the payment of the debts in case if the debts are less and the equities are more we consider it is much more better and a safer financial position absolutely madam now i would request you to please explain it in much more detail the value of the debts and equities. Uh, so, you have already explained what debt and equity are. So, debt means the long term sources of funds which might include your debentures and the long term loans which the firm has taken from either the banks or the financial institutions. Equity means the shareholders funds which includes equity share capital, preference share capital and reserves and surplus. So, debt equity ratio would be debt upon the total the sum total of the uh, equity. Now, to take an illustration of how this ratio would work, let us assume that the total equity share capital are for rupees 1 lakh, general reserves account for 45,000, accumulated profits are 30,000, debentures are 75,000, creditors are 40,000 and outstanding expenses are 10,000. Now, debt to equity would be the total debt upon the total equity. So, in our example, the we have to include only the long term loans. In this case, debentures are only the long term loans. So, the As creditors, you know that creditors and, and outstanding, outstanding expenses are the current liabilities. liabilities. So, we will not include that to be a part of our uh, debt. So, debentures account for only 75,000. So, debt means 75,000 that turns out to be our uh, numerator and equity will include the sum total of equity share capital, general reserves and accumulated profits and in all they constitute 1,75,000. So, our ratio turns out to be 3 is to 
7. 7. So, it means we are on a much more safer, safer side, side because the standard ratio says 2 is to 1. Yeah. That even if the debts are going to be double the value of the equities, the firm will be in a position to make the payment of debts well in time. Absolutely. Here in case the it equities are much, much more, more on a double side. Yeah. So, we are on a much more safer hand. We consider business as to be a good business and the business will be able to make the payments of its debts well in time. It is a kind of presumption that has been taken into consideration. If this is a situation, then this should happen. Now, suppose learner taken another case. We would like to explain you with the help of an example. Suppose a firm is having the debt equity ratio of 2 is to 1 which is standard and certain transactions took place in the business. Then what are going to be the effect of those transactions on the debt equity ratio? As I have already mentioned, suppose the debt equity of a business is 2 is to 1. Now, we have to take or presume some value which comes under this category. Say for example, the total value of the debts is 10 lakh rupees and the value of the equity is 5 lakh rupees. In the debts, we basically include debenture and loans and in equities as we have already discussed, it includes equity shareholders funds, preference shareholder funds, their reserves, any accumulated profits and so on. Suppose if a company is going to issue the debentures, then in that case, what is going to be the effect of issue of debentures on the debt equity ratio. Madam, okay. please explain about yeah. earners. In this case, when you are issuing debentures, so that means your total debentures increases. So, we had assumed 10 lakh to be the earlier debentures. Now, let us assume that 2 lakh more debentures are issued. So, in that case, from 10 lakh, the total debentures for the firm becomes 12 lakhs. Your equity remains as it is. It was 5 lakhs. So, as a result, the impact on the debt equity ratio would be that debt to equity would increase. So, increase. it will increase from 2 is to 1, which of course, it increases from the ideal state. So, it may not in the long run, it may, it may turn out to be a risky proposition for the not considered good yeah, for the it business. Not, it, it might turn out to be a risky proposition for the debenture holders. Okay. So, learners, as we know that the debts are going to remain same, only there will be an increase in the value of the equity by 2 lakh rupees the debts will remain same 10 lakh rupees while equity will increases to 7 lakh rupees. In this case, there will be an overall increase in the ratio from 2 is to 1 and this is considered as a good sign for a business. We presume that now the business is much more safe and the debts are much more safe. There is a possibility of getting their repayment well in time and it is considered good. Absolutely. Now, take an another example. Suppose if the creditors are going to be repaid, then what is going to be the effect of payment to creditors on our debt equity ratio? Now, when the creditors are going to be repaid, in that case, your current liabilities will decrease and your current assets in the form of cash balance would also decrease. So, this will not have any impact on the debt equity ratio because in debt equity ratios, we are talking in terms of the long term liabilities and the equity shareholders. Absolutely. fund. So, in this case, there will be no impact on the debt equity ratio and it remains same. exactly the same. Okay. So, learners be very careful and show that when we are talking of the debt equity ratio, you have to only take the long term debts and only the equities. Current liabilities and current assets are not to be taken into consideration. Now, we come on to the second aspects of the debt equity ratio, which covers a propriety ratio. I will request the ma'am to explain the propriety ratio to our learners. Uh, the second aspect of the liquidity ratios are the proprietary ratio that establishes the relationship between the shareholders fund and the total assets of the firm and total assets here would mean both the fixed assets, the current assets as well as the investments. Now, the basic purpose of calculating the proprietary ratio is to indicate the general financial position of the firm and the formula that is used to calculate the proprietary ratio is the total shareholders funds upon the total assets. Now, there is no ideal or uh, any satisfactory ratio which we can say that is there for the proprietary ratio, but the higher the better because in the long run it turns out to be better for the long term creditors because they are on a safer ground because again it is implying that the firm has sufficient funds to pay off the long term dues as and when they become due as well as it is able to repay its uh, interest amount. Can you explain in much more better way that what exactly we are going to include in the shareholders funds and so on? Okay. Now, the formula for proprietary ratio, I have just said it is total shareholders funds upon the total uh, assets. Now, total shareholders fund would mean the equity share capital, the preference share capital, 
the reserves and surpluses and from this sum total of these three you have to subtract the accumulated losses. What do we exactly mean by the term accumulated losses over here? Okay. Now, accumulated losses or accumulated deficit or uh, retained losses, these are the losses that are carried fro forward from the previous years and they have to be offset from the future earnings. Okay. The basic purpose is to reduce your tax liability because the profits for the current year if they get reduced automatically the tax liability or the tax burden which the firm has will also uh, decrease. So, these, these losses could be in the form of let us say profit and loss debit balance. Any such kind of losses are provided to you in your balance sheet which are going to come under the category of the miscellaneous expenditure as we have quoted right now okay, they may be the preliminary expenses discount on issue of shares or debentures or it can be any kind of loss which may arise on sale of fixed assets and so on, you are going to deduct this amount from the value of the shareholders funds. You add up the things on the liability side which comes under the category of the equity, it includes the equity shareholders funds, preference shareholders funds, all kind of profits and reserve and from there you are going to deduct the accumulated losses. So, this will account for the total shareholders fund and total assets would mean both the fixed assets plus the current assets and if at all the firm has also have some investment, so that also becomes a part of the total assets. So, your proprietary ratio would be the total shareholders fund divided by the total assets. Now, I have got a doubt over here. Okay. Suppose on a asset side we are having the fixed assets, we are having the investment, we are having the current assets and we are having some items under the miscellaneous expenditure. Then are we going to first add a miscellaneous expenditure and then we deduct it? Or are we going to leave it aside or will take only fixed assets, current assets and investment at the time of calculation of the total assets? Both ways the answer would remain the same. Okay. Either you can take fixed assets, current assets, I mean the sum total of all those four See. items that you have just stated and deduct miscellaneous expenditure See. from there or we pick up only the three items that is fixed assets, current assets and the investment. investments. Either way the answer for the total assets so, remains the same. Whenever we are going same. to calculate the total assets, only these things are to be taken care of. Can you explain this thing with the help of an example? Okay. Let me take an illustration for proprietary ratio. Let us assume that the equity share capital defined is 1 lakh, preference share capital for 50,000, reserves and surplus for 25,000, debentures for 60,000 and creditors are also defined for 15,000. In all the total liabilities accounts for 2 lakh 50,000. In the asset side of the balance sheet, we are given the fixed assets at 1 lakh 25,000 current assets as 50,000 and investments to 75,000. So, the asset side of the balance sheet also amounts to 2,50,000. Now, in order to compute the proprietary ratio, the first thing is we compute the numerator which is shareholders fund. So, in our example, it will include the equity share capital, the preference share capital and the reserves and surpluses which accounts for 1,75,000 and the total assets defined would be the fixed assets, the current assets and investments and they amount to 2,50,000. So, our ratio becomes 1,75,000 divided by 2,50,000. So, it is 0 0.7 as a pure number or we can express it as a percentage and it turns out to be 70 percent. So, in case if you want to convert the pure number into percentage, are we going to multiply it multiply by 100? Multiply it by 100 because you have to express it as a percentage. So, now what is your view? as the ratio is 70 percent. Yeah. Is it good sign for a business or it is a alarming it's, it's, one? It is a very good sign for the business because the total shareholders fund to total assets are amounting to 70, okay. 70 percent. Okay. So, in case if the higher the ratio the better, better it is better going it is. to be considered. Yeah. But there is no ideal or we can say a standard ratio to make a comparison. It depends upon industry to industry, it depends upon firm to firm. So, in our case, of course, it is on a higher side. So, we can very well assume that it is on a safer side for the business. Now, after this, the another type of ratio which comes to us as to be the leverage or a capital structure ratio. This is one of the ratio which expresses the structure of the capital in a business. I would request the madam to explain it in much more better detail. Now, the leverage or the capital structure ratios, this is another category of ratios which again measures the financial position of the firm through the capital structure. And one important ratio that is computed under this category is the capital gearing ratio. Now, first of all, let me explain what is capital structure. Now, capital structure means the proportion of the various components of the total financing of the firm. Because 
when you finance or when you talk about the total capital invested in the business, there are different sources of funding through equity share capital, through preference share capital, through debentures or through the long term loans. So, here in this ratio, we are talking in terms of the proportionate amount of these various sources or various components in the total capital employed or simply the total capital structure of the firm. I would like to ask a question in um, number of learners used to have a doubt over here ki why we include only the long term debts at the time of deciding the capital structure of a company and not the short term debts. Though I have tried my level best to explain them ki when we basically take the long term debts they are going to be repaid in a long period of time that Absolutely. is after a period yeah. of more than one, one year. year. Yeah. That is the money can be utilized very easily in a business. We can purchase machinery, we can have a building, we can have land and so on and we can generate the profits out of it by which we can repay them in time. On the other hand, when we basically take the short term debts that is from the creditors or by way of bills of exchange Bil and so on, yeah. there the payment is going to be made in a very short period of time. This simply help us in having our working capital, in conducting our business smoothly. But that cannot be considered as a part of, of the capital because they are supposed to be paid in a short period of time. This is what I have explained. Is it so? In yeah, terms it, of it, long term yeah this is how it works in accounting that when we talk about liabilities, there can either be short term liabilities or the long term liabilities. Short term liabilities would be those obligations or liabilities which are to be paid off immediately. That means you are utilizing the services that you have taken on these liabilities during that accounting period. So, that is why they are termed as short term that means during a period of 12 months for which you are preparing the accounts. Now, long term liabilities would mean the liabilities or the obligation which the business owes to the outsiders over a period of time that means they are not to be paid immediately. Let us suppose you have taken or you have issued debentures, so you have taken a debt from the public for a period of 5 years. That means they are to be redeemed up to 5 years and the amount would be a huge amount, will not be a small amount. So, this huge amount you are going to use it as a part of let us say capital employed to the business so as to purchase machineries, purchase long term assets. So, these are going to be a part of your total capital employed and that is why they are referred to as long term debts and that becomes a part of our total long term obligations. Okay. okay, Now, coming back to the capital gearing ratio what I was talking about. So, this these ratios are generally to help the financial analyst in the various components of the capital structure. So, this ratio establishes the relationship between the various components of these capital structure. That is as and when they are going to decide the total capital of the company they have to find out that how much money should be taken from the debts and how much from the equity. equity shareholders. Together with that when we are talking of the equity we have taken out four different things that equity will consist of the equity capital, preference capital, reserves and profits and so on. And when we talk of debts we have taken again the various components as the debentures are going to be there, the loan from the bank and financial institution is going to be there. So, they are going to basically calculate a ratio, a proportion that from which particular source how much funds they should raise. This is not a very layman decision that okay, you take this much loan from the bank and this much from debentures and this much from equity. A combination of all these things are to be made in such a manner so that there can be a maximization of profit to the company and a maximum return to the shareholders. So, this uh, decision that how much funds are going to be raised from which source is basically going to come under the category of the capital gearing ratio. Yeah. So, the basic purpose of computing this capital gearing ratio is to analyze the capital structure of the firm which I have been talking about and the formula that we are going to use is the equity shareholders fund to the total long term debts and the fixed interest charges or the fixed interest uh, obligation which the firm has to pay to the outsiders. Now, again there is no ideal or a standard ratio to comment that whether it is an of ideal form or not, but gearing or the components of the capital structure should be such that you are able to meet your fixed interest, fixed uh, obligations on uh, time. Now, let me explain what we mean by the term capital gearing because that forms the basis of this uh, ratio. So, what is capital gearing or what in general terminology we call it as leverage. Now, leverage or capital gearing refers to the proportion of relationship between the equity share capital which includes your reserves and surpluses 
to the fixed interest bearing funds like preference share capital, long term loans and debentures. So, you are establishing the relationship between the equity shareholders funds to the total fixed interest bearing funds. Now, I would like to interfere over yeah. here. When we are talking of the debts here in this case, especially in the yeah. capital gearing, are we going to take the preference shares as the outsiders funds in terms of debts? Otherwise, it is considered as a part of the equity. Okay. Now, so is it so? See, there is a difference between this ratio that we are computing and the debt to equity ratio which we had okay. uh, talked about earlier. Here we are talking in terms of the total owners fund. So, total owners fund would be only in the form of the equity share capital and the reserves, reserves and, and surplus. Preference share capital would not be a part of the owners uh, fund because they have an option of redemption. If and some yeah, or the other they are going to be, to be redeemed. redeemed and plus they carry a fixed rate of dividend. dividend. So, they come under the category of fixed interest bearing Security. funds fixed in, because on debentures also you have to pay a fixed rate of interest Security. on preference shareholders also you have to pay a fixed rate of dividends whereas in case of equity shareholders nothing is fixed at the time of issue. So, it totally depends upon the profits that are being uh, generated. So, if the firm is able to generate a better profit then of course, the rate of dividends to the equity shareholders would be higher and in case it is less of course, the rate of dividends. So, there is no fixed. So, our learners are going to be much more careful at the time of calculating the capital gearing ratio because in normally in other cases what we have done that preference shares are going to be taken as a part of the equity shareholders. Whenever we are going to calculate the value of equity we add the preference, but here especially in case of the capital gearing ratio preference share will not be the part of the equity they are going to become the part of the long term debts which are one hour than another as to be repaid as the madam has told you right now ki preference shares are going to be paid a fixed rate of dividend as it is going to be paid a fixed rate of interest in case of the debentures. So, equity will here include only the equity share capital, their reserves and the profits. Yeah. Here since we are talking in terms of the composition of the capital structure, so we are trying to determine that whether debt is more that means the fixed interest bearing securities are higher or the equity share capital are higher. So, in financial language we try to find out that whether the firm is highly geared or it is low geared. So, in order to make a comparison between high geared and low geared what we mean by this is if the proportion of equity share capital is less than the fixed interest bearing funds then we say that it is high geared. And if it is the opposite case that means the equity share capital proportion is greater than the fixed interest bearing funds then it becomes low geared. So, in case if the debts are more in comparison to the equity then it is high geared. highly geared yeah. and in case if the equity is more then it then becomes in comparison, then you then call it it as low, geared. low geared. So, that is the financial terminology or financial language uh, which we use to okay. identify the two. Now, let me clearly state on because there could be a confusion between debt equity and capital gearing. Now, capital gearing please understand that we are only talking in terms of the components of the capital structure that what is the percentage of let us say debt, what is the percentage of equity, what is the percentage of preference and we cluster fixed interest bearing funds together. So, preference, debentures, long term loans becomes one cluster and equity is what the proprietors or the owners have. So, we cluster them in into another category. So, you define a relationship between these two clusters that is the main objective of computing the capital gearing uh, ratio. Now, let me uh, take an example to explain what we mean by highly geared and what is low geared in uh, capital gearing. Let us assume we have been given information relating to the year 2010 and 2011 in respect of equity share capital reserves and other items. Now, equity share capital for let, let me say for 2010 is 5 lakhs, for 2011 it is 4 lakhs, reserves and surpluses are 5, 3 lakhs and 2 lakh respectively for 2010 and 11, long term loans are 2 lakh 50,000 and 3 lakh respectively and the total debentures for the firm for 2010 are 2 lakh 50,000 and 4 lakh for 2011. Here I would like to yes. interfere. As you have mentioned 6 percent uh, before the debentures, what do we exactly mean by the term 6 percent? Yeah. Now, when the debentures are issued to the general public, your rate of interest is predefined. Okay. In case of equity shareholders, you will see that, that there is no percentage 
uh, in terms of dividends. Yes, in terms of dividends because that is totally dependent upon the profits firm's the yeah, profits and the firm's decision that whether it wants to retain its earning or whether it wants to distribute, distribute it as uh, dividends. But in terms of debentures, it is absolutely clear at the time of issuance that you have to pay your interest obligation. So, even if the company is not generating profits during the current year, it still has to make payments for its interest obligation by either selling off its uh, fixed assets or sometimes using the reserves and surpluses. One hour or another they are they going have to make to, the yes, payment of interest. Yes, they cannot defer it to the next year. Next year. Whereas in case of dividends, there is no obligation. If they want, they can declare a dividend. If they do not want, they may not declare the uh, dividend. So, that is why the pre, the rate of interest is all, all, always predefined in case of uh, debentures. Is it going to make any effect on our question? If any percentage is given as you have mentioned that this is going to be the rate of interest before the debenture, as in when our learners are going to calculate a debt equity ratio, is this percentage is going to have any effect on our question? No, as far as the computation of capital gearing ratios goes, the rate of interest is immaterial. So, here it is of not of much importance, but if the same information we were using to compute the profitability ratios, then of course, the rate of interest becomes important because we have to take the interest component also into it. Now, coming back to the same illustration which I was explaining, so the capital gearing ratio for 2010 would be your equity shareholders fund, so which is 5 lakh for equity plus the reserves and surpluses divided by the fixed interest bearing funds, which in our case includes the long term liabilities and debentures and together they account for 5 lakhs. So, 8 lakh divided by 5 lakh gives us 8 is to 5. five. Now, for 2011 also we compute it in a similar manner where 4 lakh plus 2 lakh accounts for the equity shareholders fund upon the, the fixed interest bearing funds which accounts for long term loans and debentures for 7 lakh and the ratio turns out to be 6 is to 7. Now, in comparison to 2010, the ratio was 8 is to 5, now it is 6 is to 7. So, in 2010, it, the firm is referred to as low geared because the ratio of equity was greater than the fixed debts. In, yeah, the debts you can say hmm. and in the uh, year 2011, the case becomes for just high, just the opposite, it hmm. turns out to be high geared 6 is to 7 where debt exceeds your shareholders fund. So, learners with our today's discussion, I hope that two different type of major ratios are going to be quite clear to you. One is we have talked about the solvency ratio which is calculated to know the long term ability of the firm to make the payments of its debts and it include two different type of ratio which we have taken as the debt equity ratio and the propriety ratio. Together with that, we have discussed on the leverage ratio or a capital structure ratio which is calculated to know that what type of, uh, what are the means of finance for a company that how much funds are going to be raised from which source and you know that we have classified them into the low geared or the highly geared. I hope keeping in view these things in your mind and the illustration which we have taken in our discussion are going to help you in solving out the further questions that are given in your self learning material. Keeping you all these things, I hope the formulas, the significance and the meaning you are going to take care at the time of solving your questions. All the best. Thank you for being here with us, madam. Thank you. I thanks a lot on behalf of NIUS that My you pleasure. have spent your valuable time and provide such useful information to our learners. Thank you very much.